and begin to speak those things over your life, but being honest with God about where you're at. We don't have to be in charge. We don't have to be or, or, or to appear in control. I remember a time in my life, let, let me just say this. You see, there's a time when we have to come boldly for the throne of grace and knock on that door and get what we need. Yes. There might not be any tears. It's just faith rising up within you and I've seen it operate and you go get it. It belongs to you and you take it back to the devil and you get it. But there's other times in your life that God brings you to brokenness and with tears you cry out to God and He hears and He moves. It isn't both of them are faith. You're not crying to Muhammad. You're crying to a living God and you're believing that the God of the brokenhearted is going to hear you and answer your prayers. And I, I, I remember God moving many times in my life through boldness and I remember other times He moved through weeping. And I remember this one time I'm unemployed and my daddy told me to work. If you don't, if you don't work, something's wrong. We need to work. Okay, We need to work. And I remember I, I, I'm laid off for six months I remember getting on my knees. My unemployment's about ready to run out, and so the stress was getting a little bit stronger. And I remember getting on my knees with tears, crying out to God, God, I need a job. The next morning, the phone rang. Just as Egypt cried out, the Word says God heard their cry. Listen, we need to be real people. There's a story in the Bible about a lady who was barren named Hannah. Couldn't have any children. Year after year after year after year, she would go before the Lord in the temple. And, 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 and the, the, the other wife would come. And the, the, you know, there was another wife. Uh, her husband had another wife, is what I'm saying. And, they, and, and there was some jealousy there because she had a bunch of kids. And, and Hannah would come and there was no children. There was, there was no children. There was, and you know, for, for a woman, uh, especially during that time, she needed to bear children. It was part of her identity and part of her hope in life. And that she, were, she went this one time and the priest seen her and he thought she was drunk because her lips began to tremble. And she began to weep. And he says, woman, why do you get drunk and come to the temple like this? She said, sir, don't, don't think of me this way. I need a child. And he tells her, go your way. About nine months later, out come a baby boy named Samuel, the prophet, one of the greatest men in the Old Testament, came out of weeping. Weeping comes in the night, the joy comes in the morning. Amen. Church, I'm not saying work yourself up into weeping. If you've got boldness, go. Get what you need. But if you're in a place of brokenness or you need to be in a place of brokenness, admit where you're at. Be willing to be broken. To hear some people's theology, they would rebuke Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. They would. If they, if they actually practiced what they preached, they would rebuke Jesus because Jesus wept and Jesus was sweating great drops of, like great drops of blood and He was in anxiety. And some people say, well, you just need to believe, man. You don't have healing because you don't have faith. And, man, we go through things. We have to face things as we go through them. Life and your will doesn't always fit together. Life and God's will doesn't always fit together. It creates some stress sometimes. And sometimes it takes some brokenness in our life in order to change. But I'm going to tell you something. When you come to Him in brokenness, you find an intimacy Amen. with the Father of mercy. You see, God has many attributes. Mercy is one of those. And you, you experience His mercy. You experience His grace when you come to Him in weakness. I can't, but you can. Amen. You see, David found himself in many hopeless situations. And when you read the book of Psalms, I just wrote down a few uh, phrases scattered throughout the book of Psalms. He said, why do you stand afar off? He's speaking to God. He's, he's at least having a relationship with him. He's just not, he's just not quoting the scripture with no relationship. Another place, Lord, they have increased to trouble me. Another place, how long, O oh Lord, will
will you forget me? Another place was Jesus quoted later, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now he ends his psalms in praise to God. And we need to do the same when we cry out to God. We need to know that He is God and that He is faithful. But one thing about David is he had a real relationship with God and expressed real emotions about real things that were going on in his life. Not superficial. I'm not trying to get you to change your confession into a negative one, but to be real before God. You see, your weakness will bind you to others which fellowship is an awesome thing. Or prosperity will not. When, when everything is going good, will not. When you're, when you're healthy, when you're wealthy, things are good, no troubles, no trials, it isn't a, there is no binding process. A man gets in trouble, you know what he wants to do? He wants to talk. You know how many people say they want me to come down to the jail and talk to them? Okay? They do. When they weren't in jail, they didn't want to talk. <laughs> they, they didn't just want to talk, but now that they're in trouble, they want to talk. That's what people do when they get in trouble. We face trials. We want somebody to talk to, someone that can understand a little bit about what we're, pay, what we're facing. Paul says he experienced what he experienced for a reason. If you've been going through suffering, there's a reason for the suffering that you've experienced. Listen, if you're a child of God, there's a reason. I have to always look back at everything in my life and even the things that I face currently that I may face and think, what is the purpose that God has for this situation? Because there's always a reason. And Paul is basically saying there's a reason for our, that, that we went through what we went through, and the reason we went through it is that we may be able to console you. That we may be able to encourage you. Let me share something with you. If nobody's ever went through any problems, they're not they're not really they're not they're really not a very good listener. They really are not that interested in your problems. But when they have went through it, and you go through it, there's a certain compassion that develops as a result of there's a, there's, a, there's a bond between you and you're able to minister to one another. I love going to the jail. And I love going to the jail because I remember the bondage that I once was in. I, I, I go in and I say, I can't tell you that, I, that I've done everything you've done. And I say, all I can tell you is I once was lost. I once, was, I once was bound by alcoholism and I'm no longer bound. Christ has set me free. And so I always try to meet them where they're at because I know that there's, there's, there, there's a connection there in the suffering that they're experiencing. I don't bond very well to those who, who aren't done yet. I don't bond very well to those who just want to keep on doing their thing. But for those that are broken, I connect. You see, the Christian who can never admit weakness, they may look good on the outside and they may know some scriptures, but let me tell you, they are absolutely useless to your suffering. If they superficially have all the answers and fail to come alongside you, or you fail to come alongside them with all the answers, you're, you become useless. So your suffering has purpose. <coughs> I know a pastor, and I love him very much. But he would stand behind the pulpit, and he it was always perfect. Never no issue. Never no issue at home. Never no issue in the church. Never no issue on the board. Never no issue anywhere. Always perfect. But I knew it wasn't perfect because we couldn't get along during worship practice. And I knew it wasn't perfect because when I called, I could hear in his voice, distress. But superficiality, always putting forth, projecting that image, keeps you from being healed. And it keeps you actually separated from others because people would feel like he's got something that we can't have because he must live a different life than we live. 
Suffering helps other people. Testimonies of faith bring courage in their life. When we see people that go through trials, that's the reason why I videoed the, uh, the, the uh, Carolyn test, life testimony on Tuesday night because it brought, I see people with tears running down their face and crying. I see one woman say, this is going to be our church. <laughs> Because God brought you through something. And you share that, you encourage other people with your testimony. If you never go through nothing, you don't have anything to share. You can share the Word, but you don't have life experience that God can bring you through it. See, the rest of us in the world go through life. Some people live in a bubble. But the rest of us go through a thing called life. It doesn't always feel good. It hurts to see sinners sin, right? It hurts to see the righteous fall, a spouse that lives less than what they are called to be. It hurts when others reject us. It hurts when we're criticized or lied to, despitefully used. It hurts. It's real pain. But the Word says the God of all comfort will console us. He's the Father of mercy. Amen. You see... We hear a word, he says, don't, 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 do not despise the chastening of the Lord. And even though this is not the chastening, that's one of the things that God does. He disciplines us. But this is another characteristic of who God is. Mercy. He's a God that disciplines us, isn't He? Yes. But He's also the God of mercy. To lift our heads, to encourage us, to console us, to comfort us, to bring us from where we're at to the place that we need to be. There's prosperity to be obtained, divine health to walk in. I believe it with all of my heart. But listen, there's a real world where real faith is needed for us to operate in. And I believe in prosperity and I believe in divine health. But there's one of the things I want you to understand. It says even as our soul prospers. Well, let me tell you something. You don't want the prosperity financially until this soul is prospering. Amen. God cares more about your soul than He does your pocketbook. And God cannot be manipulated even though I believe in tithing and when you give to God, God returns it into your life, but He loves you enough to bless you some other ways first before He begins to cause you to overflow in your pocketbook. We are to prosper even as our soul prospers. Suffering not only helps others, Julie can come, but it helps the person who suffers. Well, that don't make any sense. Suffering not only helps others, but it helps the person who's suffering. Because God is able to do something in your life. You see, the whole purpose with uh, that Scripture in Romans 8, all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to His purpose is that God can shape you and then do something with your life. You know what it's like when you don't let God mold you and shape you? You're, you're like a hardened vessel. You, you're untouchable. You, you leave when, some, when a word's spoken that you don't like. You, you, you harden your heart. You rebel. Set under the Word. Hear the, let the sword cut you every now and then and still love Him and see what happens. Let Him operate. Let Him do what He wants to do. Paul says, this happened that we might not rely on ourselves but on God who raises the dead. This happened that I might console you, he said, but it also happened that I might be able to understand myself. I can't rely on myself. I can't even rely on myself. I can't rely on my strength. The reason, one of the reasons why we pray, we need to pray because we want to have fellowship with God, but one of the reasons why we pray, God, don't let me operate in my strength. Let me operate in your strength, in your spirit, in your groove that you would have us to operate in, that we don't end up doing our own thing. You see, God takes us in weakness and shows His power, but we have to recognize that weakness. We don't give up because we're weak. We don't faint because we're weak. And if you feel sickly, we, I, I remember when my wife and I were, I, I was finishing Bible college and, and I remember 
standing or getting ready to go up and preach before all these preachers, it's one thing to preach to people, it's another thing to preach to preachers. And to stand up and preach these preach to these other preachers and future preachers, and they got cue cards in their hand and they're going to write down words, good or bad, about you when you're done. And you get to read them. Whether you're a good preacher or wasn't a preacher, a wasn't a preacher, or quit the ministry or whatever, you don't know what was going to come out. But that was that was part of it. I'm going to tell you, I was sitting by my wife, she wasn't my wife yet, getting ready to be, and I was saying, I don't want to do it. I was so sick. I would go and preach at this little uh, at this little country church. I didn't know how to preach. I knew how to pray, but I didn't know how to preach. And I'd go up and share a few words and they seemed to like it, all six of them. <laughs> I'd take up the offering and I would sing the songs, actually. But I went sickly. Just to preach to six elderly people. But I went sickly. But what song and weakness becomes power. <clears throat> when you humble yourself in weakness, in the bad marriage, in the addiction, in the situation of your life and say, God, I can't. I don't know how to love her. I don't know how to love him. I don't know how to overcome this thing in my life. You do. And then you find out the power of God begins to flow in your life because you surrender. We could all be like Adam who, who when God came down from from, from his, his, his dwelling place and began to dwell with Adam. Adam had already sinned. Adam took off. Even after he covered himself. See, Adam tried to fix himself. He tried to cover his own self with fig leaves. That was the best he could do. And God comes down looking for him. So why are you running? Well, uh, he's found out. And he's found out trying to fix his own self because he messed himself up. You're just like Adam. I'm just like Adam. There's, there's, there's nothing in us that's absolutely perfect. We're, we're in a state of progression, heading toward being holier, being sanctified. But there's still weakness in our life, and we can't fix ourselves, so we surrender ourselves to Him. Lord, fix me. Heal me. You got an addiction problem this morning, and you know somebody does it. It isn't really recovery. They need to be born again. That's why places like Teen Challenge and Good Samaritan Inn and, 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 and other places work, because when they get born again, they're assigned. That's the reason why the government has a 3% success rate and the church has a like 80 or 90%. Because they get born again, they become a new person. They sow themselves first in weakness. God takes that in their life, whatever He can get, and makes something out of it. He would stand that way.